we were discussing the phase lock loop frequency synthesizer using a three state uh, phase frequency detector. <coughs> the three state phase frequency detector or PFD, it consists of uh, two flip flops. And when the two outputs Q A and Q B are simultaneously high, both flip flops are reset. And if these are given to up and down inputs of a charge pump, it will drive the VCO in the right direction, assuming A is the reference and B is the feedback signal. Okay. So, either uh, Q A or Q B will be high for some time, a time equal to the phase difference between the uh, time corresponding to the phase difference between rising edges of A and B. Okay. The other one will be high momentarily before falling to 0. Okay. So, we saw that if uh, A and B at the same frequency, then average of up minus down is phi by 2 pi, where phi is the phase difference. Okay. This assumes that this is somehow starts up in a state where A is leading B. Okay. Now, of course, A leading B by phi is the same as B leading A by 2 pi minus phi. So, you could get that output also. But what is important for the operation of the PLL is how the output changes as the phase changes and that is always that if A starts leading by more and more, the output average starts increasing, Okay, that is how it works. And if the frequency of A is greater than frequency of B, average of up minus down, what is it? Yeah, this is half. And this is minus half. So, it even gives a definite indication of the frequency difference, right. <coughs> Unlike some other phase detectors like the XOR phase detector or the uh, multiplier type phase detector, there if the frequencies are different, the long term average will be 0. Okay? So, this is commonly used in uh, PLLs. Now, you can use regular flip flops, there are different structures for this. You do not need a very general flip flop in that you know that the D input is tied to 1. So, there are structures in which there is no explicit D input at all, but it is just that when the clock edge rises, the output switches to high. So, those things are there. If there is time, we will discuss those. Now, there is one other uh, fine, one other uh, practical point that we have to discuss. So far, we have been drawing waveforms with uh, 0 rise and fall times and no delays in the gates and things like that. So, if I will just draw one cycle. If A leads B by a small amount, okay, what happens is Q A must be this small pulse. and Q B this must be this infinite smelly small pulse, right. Now, what happens is in any given uh, process, there will be a limit to how small a pulse you can produce that is related to the rise times of uh, different gates. Okay. The finer the process, the smaller the rise time and you can produce narrower pulses. So, what happens in reality is let us say that I mean I will draw it so that uh, the technology is very slow. So, Q A it would have done something like this. I mean if it goes to high the rise time is quite large, 
it tends to do that ok and q b also starts rising high ok. Now, these are the two inputs to the AND gate which produce the reset signal right. Now, exactly when the AND gate output goes high when two there are two slow inputs like this it is not uh, clear you have to simulate and see there may also be asymmetry between these two inputs ok that is because I mean how do you make a CMOS AND gate. Yeah, 2 PMOS and 2 NMOS, but how do you connect them? NMOS in series, PMOS in parallel. I mean, this is a NAND gate, but uh, that is ok, I will not distinguish between them. Maybe the reset can be active low, right. So, let me just show a NAND gate here. First of all, will it uh, respond in the same way to A and B that is will the delays and those things be the same clearly not because uh, if you look at it A is the device on top B is the device on the bottom. So, let us say you want to make uh, I mean you want to use the, this of course, is very simple and nice to use, but uh, you want to make it symmetrical what do you have to do what could you do yeah and then. Yeah, so you all you can I mean in CMOS what you can do is you can just connect it like this. I mean this means that you have a second gate which is also I mean second NMOS pair which is also driving this. This at least makes it more symmetrical right and of course, these PMOS devices will anyway appear in parallel. So, you have to double their widths. Okay, so, you can make it symmetrical, but anyway I mean it, uh, so when the two input starts rising high let us just assume that <coughs> when both inputs are above VDD by 2 uh, the output will go high ok. Now, what happens is when Q B is later so when it goes above VDD by 2 the output starts going high right and <coughs> At this point, QA is actually just up a little bit above VDD by 2, it has not reached VDD ok. So, what can happen is this can I mean the re this itself will have some delay the output rising, but let us say that delay is small for whatever reason Maybe the parasitics on these two is higher and that is smaller all that can happen right, because these two are driving charge pump switches whereas, this is driving a flip flop. So, QA may not rise completely at all and it falls like that and then QB also has some uh, waveform which does not look like a digital pulse right it has uh, something like that ok. So, because of this uh, what happens is if you have uh, very small phase differences if you have large phase differences what will happen is QA would have the, the first one the first edge it is uh, output would have the output corresponding to that flip flop would have risen to VDD and then it starts falling from there ok and this will be something. So, and as you change phi the uh, period for which it is at VDD increases by the same amount. So, the average output increases by the same amount, but when the phase difference becomes very small both pulses will be some partial pulses like this they are not digital at all. So, if you plot the characteristic that is average value of Q A minus Q B versus phi you know that ideally it is supposed to do this ok. <coughs> In reality what can happen is the output can be smaller everywhere this itself does not matter I mean that is like slightly changing the output of the phase detector, but at small phase differences it is actually not responding to any change in the phase difference that is the gain of the phase detector is 0 the incremental gain of the phase detector is 0 around 0 phase difference ok. So, when the phase difference is very small and it changes by a little bit it is not changing this is quite bad ok. This is known as the 
dead zone of the phase detector where the incremental gain is almost 0. Why is this bad? Yeah, steady state error and also it is supposed to nominally lock to 0 phase difference, right. When it locks to nominally uh, 0 phase difference, so let us say it is somehow magically locked there, then there are disturbances in the loop because of the VCOS phase noise, because of the resistors noise and so on. That will change the phase by a little bit, but this will not respond at all, okay. Now, we have not evaluated the transfer functions, but you do know from the study of the CDR that uh, the noise from the resistor and the noise from the VCO will be filtered in some way by the loop. Right now, it is not responding to it at all. If the phase detector does not respond, there is no loop, okay, is not it? The reason the loop is there is because the phase detector responds to phase changes, but uh, let us say the VCO phase changes because of its phase noise, then there is no correcting uh, force at all because let us say somehow it is magically locked to zero phase difference. Then if the VCO phase difference moves by a little bit and the, the amount of movement because of phase noise is always quite small, okay. Uh, it is not going to be in like several degrees or something in uh, from cycle to cycle. So, it will be quite small. So, that means that uh, this will not respond. So, the VCO phase noise will come out as it is. Now, this defeats the purpose. One of the purposes of the PLL besides getting frequency multiplication is to filter out the VCO phase noise at low frequencies. So, that would not work, okay. The possible solution to this. What is the key problem here? Or why do we have this problem? Huh? Yeah, basically you cannot, I mean we can just uh, uh, summarize it as we cannot produce pulses smaller than a certain width in a given process. That you have to simulate and see, but you can try to uh, like let us say you have a chain of inverters and then uh, you, you apply an input rectangular pulse, you go on reducing its width. After a while, the pulse will just disappear. It will not even come out of the chain. So, that will kind of tell you what is the minimum width that you need, so that it passes through the chain without getting attenuated, okay. So, you have some width. So, that is the problem. So, you cannot produce widths below a certain value. So, what is the solution? I mean, you look at the operation of the phase detector, the way it is right now, in normal operation, Q A, uh, I mean, let me assume that A is leading B. So, Q A will be a pulse corresponding to the phase difference between rising edges of A and B. And Q B is always this absurdly narrow pulse, right? Ideally, it is just jumping up and down immediately. So, this will never work. So, what is it that we have to do? Yeah, how do you do that? Clearly, we cannot have an architecture where ideally we think that Q B should be this infinitesimal sliver, right. So, what is it that you can change so that you will have, yeah, that is exactly what is done. What you do is you modify the circuit so that even nominally Q B will be a pulse of some fixed width, okay, and that is done by increasing the delay in the reset path. Now, increasing the delay meaning I mean you may not explicitly put a delay or you have a gate with a certain amount of delay or you may have like couple of inverters to increase the delay all this is possible, okay. But what happens now is if you have a reset path delay, so <coughs> Q A will go high here, okay, and Q B will go high over there, okay, and the reset does not happen until Q A and Q B simultaneously go high and some uh, T reset afterwards, right. So, <coughs> both will be high for a certain period, and this width equals T reset, okay.
in this case what happens is up is high for a period phi by 2 pi times t ref plus the reset delay and down is high for a period equal to the equal to the reset delay right so this causes a dead zone which means that uh, pll unresponsive to small phase differences it can also lock to an offset but that itself may not be a problem in a frequency synthesizer by frequency synthesizer what i mean is something that generates a periodic signal but around that point it will be unresponsive to small uh, phase changes and that is a problem any questions here does this change the operation of the phase detector in some way what will be the average output of the phase detector same because if you take up minus down this uh, part the common part is uh, pulse equal to tau reset right so this part is like the common part and that cancels out the difference is still that one so ideally the difference still remains the same it is phi by 2 pi okay but the each one individually has an extra uh, width equal to t reset okay are there any disadvantages to this yeah so that is actually an important thing so <coughs> if you have a phase frequency detector and we use the up and down pulses So, this is what we have. Now, whether up and down are both high or both low, the charge from current will be 0, okay. at least if we ignore mismatch, even if both are high, the charge from current will be 0 nominally. But the difference is, as I said, if uh, this is without mismatch, but there is a difference in the noise though. When up and down are both 0, these current sources are not even connected to the loop filter. So, whatever noise these current sources have cannot possibly affect the phase noise. Okay? Uh, but if up and down are both high, the noise from ICP, the upper and lower sources, they are not equal to each other, they are uncorrelated, they are different current sources. right? So, they just get added up. Okay. That is why you also do not want to work crazy and then increase this T reset to a very large volume. Okay. Is there any other issue that you may see? <coughs> if T reset is very large or with any non-zero value of T reset, power 
consumption, yeah, okay, that's fine. That's some small thing. Spur, yeah, that we have not discussed. We'll come to that. Right now, there is no spur because uh, that happens only with charge from mismatch, right? If uh, there is no charge from mismatch, there is no spur. That we will come to. In the basic operation of the phase detector itself, the phase detector, what is the range of this phase detector? What is the range over which it gives you a straight line? Huh? It is not minus pi 2 pi, it is minus 2 pi to 2 pi. So, does this affect it in some way? Shift, why? No, this will not lock to offset. The small signal wise, I mean, uh, we again assuming no mismatch, right? This common parts of the pulses will cancel out. The, the average of out up minus down is still 5 by 2 pi. But I mean, I gave you a hint, right, about the range. So, you should look at the other end of the range and then see if something happens. Uh, then what will happen? I mean, let us say if the phase difference is close to 2 pi, what happens? They will miss a pulse, right? Now, this is A and this is B. I mean, the way the waveform looks like, you would probably say B is leading A, that is true, but there is the same as A leading B by F phi equal to this. I mean, the phase detector can go into either of these modes, right? It is possible. Now, Q A will rise high here and ideally Q B should have gone up here and immediately pulled both of them down. Okay. But in reality what happens is that Q A will rise high and Q B will also rise high at this point. Huh? Yeah, so what happens is let us say this is uh, there is a reset delay of this much. Okay. So, Q A will do that, right? Because uh, this rising edge of A appears there, okay. That will pull <coughs> Q A high, but it will get reset immediately afterwards. Is that correct or no? The reset is asynchronous, right? So, at this point, uh, the first uh, the upper flip flop is not yet reset. Okay, it has an input of one. Its output was high, and it will remain high. Okay, but it gets reset after a certain delay. Okay, so now what happens is for the second cycle, there is no phase detection information at all, isn't it? So it misses this. edge information. Now, I have been considering cases where the frequencies of A and B are exactly equal. Now, when the PLL is acquiring lock, they will be slightly different. Okay, So, the edges can come a little bit earlier and later and so on. So, in those cases also this happens and uh, in fact, it happens more often because the a edge of A could even come a little bit earlier than that. You should not miss out all that. If you assume the ideal case where uh, b, uh, like uh, Q B just jumps up and then immediately pulls down, it won't do that. But uh, in this case, it will uh, miss the uh, following edge. Okay, it's possible. 
So, that is also effectively like lowering the phase detector gain right, because now both Q, Q B will get reset in the next cycle nothing works and in the following cycle it starts working again and so on ok. I will show only this not the other possible paths right that is there, but anyway let me show this part. <coughs> what will happen is that uh, it will work properly here, but then towards the end it will start tapering off and then the gain will reduce ok and here also the gain can reduce. Okay. So, this uh, means that it has compromised the range, these are known as uh, blind zones where the phase detector is not even working. Okay. Not even working meaning it will detect the edges if the two are of exact same frequency, but it will keep missing some stuff. Okay. <coughs> Is this fine? I guess this is not it does not I mean in reality I think it does curve like this because everything is kind of rounded off, but in the ideal operation I guess it will just stop here and then do something like this right. The gain becomes half of what it was ok, where this uh, gap this is a phase difference corresponding to the reset delay ok. So, clearly this is also not what you want to have, having some reset delay is important because you do not want a dead zone uh, at the same time you do not want uh, too much of a blind zone either. So, you do not go crazy with the value of T reset you use whatever is required and all these things vary with uh, process and temperature. So, you use the value of T reset that works for you uh, to avoid dead zone over all process corners and that is it ok. Any questions here? So, any phase detector that you make I mean we discussed it specifically for this uh, 3 state phase detector, uh, most of them will tend to have some dead zone and some blind zone uh, or at least one of them. So, you have to see how you can best avoid them ok. Now, let us put the whole loop together again, this is F ref coming from a crystal oscillator, we have our uh, P state P of D, whose up and down signals drive a charge from and a loop filter. I have kept the same loop filter that we derived for the CDR. Let us see what we have to do with that. This is F out nominally equal to n times F ref ok. Such a block is called a frequency synthesizer 
because you can synthesize multiple frequencies by changing the division modulus. Okay. If you change n, uh, the output will I mean if you change from n to n plus 1, the output will change from n f ref to n plus 1 f ref. Now, provided that the VCO has enough range, the VCO should be able to get to that frequency. As long as it can do that, you can go on changing n and uh, getting different frequencies. Okay, and this is known uh, in particular as an integer n frequency synthesizer. Obviously, division modulus is an integer, so you can only get an integer multiple of the reference frequency. Okay, there is also a fractional n frequency synthesizer. We will probably not go into that uh, here. The way it is done is you can't make a fractional divider, you can't make a circuit that gives you like let us say 1.3 times the period of the input. What you do is you modulate between different values of n, so that on average you have some fraction. That is you switch between n and n plus 1 uh, 50 percent of the time each, then you will have n plus half. So, on average it is like dividing by n plus half and the output will contain a tone but it also has lot of other uh, details to be taken care of because it is not exactly a division by n plus half. Okay. So, this is an integer n uh, frequency synthesizer. First, we will look at uh, <coughs> the incremental model in the phase domain and then see what other artifacts come up here uh, which are harmful and how to avoid them. Okay. <coughs> so, nominally these two are in phase, 0 phase difference at the operating point. I will assume that this has started up and it has locked. There is no jitter anywhere, no phase noise in the VCO, no noise anywhere, no noise in the reference. Okay? Then of course, you can add all these different effects and then see what happens. So, first of all, <laughs> I will assume that the input, uh, the input should be an ideal periodic signal but we know that no signal is going to be periodic. Even the crystal oscillator will have phase noise. Its phase noise will be very low because we saw from the phase noise formula for the LC oscillators and the crystal is nothing but uh, it is a mechanical system, but it behaves like an LC oscillator. Its Q is like very high 10,000 or something like that. So, that 1 by Q square makes the oscillation oscillator phase noise very low. Okay. So, but whatever it is, there will be some phase disturbance. Once there is a phase disturbance here, you will see disturbances everywhere. Okay. So, there will be some incremental output phase, there will be some incremental control voltage and there will be some incremental feedback phase. Okay. Uh, ideally, I assume that this is 0 and that is 0 also, but in reality they will have some values. Okay. Now, of course, this is not the only thing that can cause these increments. You also have the noise of the resistor and you have the phase noise of the VCO, which uh, we will see how to add and then you have the current noise of the charge point. Okay. All these things will uh, and you also have the phase noise of the divider which we neglect usually it is not a big contributor, but you have also a phase noise of the divider which will get added up. Okay. <coughs> so, now we need an incremental model for this whole thing, so that we can find the relationship between finally, what you want is to calculate phi out the phase noise of the output okay, in response to each of these things, so that you can optimize the contributions and so on or at least identify the biggest contributor and then see what you can do about it. So, what would be the model? I think this we have done before. So, what would be the relationship between V control and phi out? Huh? Yeah, in the Laplace domain it is just 2 pi k V C O by S. Okay. This phi out is 2 pi k V C O integral of V control over time. Okay. This assumes that the VCO's characteristic is linear. That is okay. That we'll assume for now. Then, what is the? <coughs> so we have the 
this is the output phase in the Laplace domain and that is the control voltage in the Laplace domain. Okay. Now, we have the charge from current I C P. So, what is the relationship between I C P and V control? It is the same, I mean this is a linear circuit, right? This I C P in the Laplace domain times the Laplace impedance of this is the control voltage. So, that is exactly the same. So, I will show it separately like this, like a block diagram, but basically it is a linear circuit and the incremental equivalent is the same as the linear circuit. This is the output current of the charge pump. I also use the uppercase I C P to mean uh, the current source value in the charge pump. Maybe I should change that to I naught so that we do not confuse between this and that I C P. Okay. <coughs> what is the model for the phase detector? or phase detector plus charge foam. What is the? Yeah, it takes the difference between phi f and phi f b and multiplies it by I C P by 2 pi or I naught by 2 pi. Okay. Now, the only thing remaining is the divider. So, what is the phase domain model of the divider? What do you think it is? What is it? What do you think it is? Yeah. What, uh, what would be the phase domain model of the divider? That is, remember this is a signal at f out or n times f ref and let us say it has, I mean let me draw it separately. So, I have a divide by n this is the input and this is the output. This is a signal at n times f ref. Okay. Maybe you can think of it as cos, it may not be a cosine waveform, but you understand what I mean 2 pi times n by f ref t plus phi out. What will the output be? It will of course, be at f ref or maybe let me not even confuse with f ref. Let me just say f 1, this is 2 pi f 1 t, this is at f 1 by n. So, I will have a periodic signal at f 1 by n t plus what will be the phase? Huh? Divided by n, why? Yeah. So, the easiest way to uh, think about this is let us say I mean I will draw the waveform for a divide by 2 counter. This is f in and let us say f out is it is triggered on the rising edges. So, it is a counter right it is just gives you one cycle for every uh, 2 cycles of the input. <coughs> okay. Now, let us say I shift the phase of this maybe starting from this point. Okay. So, this time difference is some delta t and its phase difference would be delta t by the period of the input times 2 pi. Okay. What will the output waveform look like? It will be delayed by the same amount. Okay. The whole thing will just be delayed by exactly the same delta t. Okay. So, this is still delta t, but now this is delta t on a signal which has a longer period which is twice as long. So, the phase changes this corresponds to delta t by t out which is 2 times t in times 2 pi. So, from here to there it is a factor of half. Okay. So, it is easiest to see that if you shift the input signal of a divider by some delta t the output shifts by exactly the same time, but that corresponds to 
a smaller phase difference because the output period is much larger ok n times larger. So, the dividers Uh, <coughs> model is an attenuation of 1 by n in the phase domain or a gain of 1 by n in the phase domain attenuation by a factor of n ok. So, what is the difference between this and the CDR in the model? The only difference is the frequency divider, right? Everything else remains exactly the same, okay? Because all the other stuff we had, if you remember the model of the linear CDR, first of all, we had this density factor because of random data, but excluding that, we had the same phase detector gain, same uh, loop filter transfer function, and the same VCO stuff. The only thing is the feedback part has a uh, attenuation of factor of n, okay? Now, let us complete the model. How do I add the phase noise of the VCO? Where should I do that? At the output of the VCO. The output phase of the VCO would be the integral of uh, V control, which is what the deterministic part is, and the random part, which is its own phase noise. So, here I have, I call this just phi VCO. It means whatever phase noise is added by the V C O, okay. And where do I add the phase noise to the divider? That is the divider also because it has uh, its transistors will have noise, will have jitter. That means that if a divider is driven by an ideal periodic signal, the output should ideally be a periodic signal of n times longer period, but it will be jittering around that. Okay. So where should I add that? I mean, where I mean, there aren't that many places here at the output of the divider, that is all, ok. I call it phi div, This type of modeling is quite important, especially in PLLs, because uh, many circuits, right? You can simulate the entire circuit at the transistor level for noise also, including noise. But PLL, it can be quite difficult because uh, the frequencies are quite different. It takes a really long time, and <coughs> in transient, you can try to calculate noise, but uh, that is not very accurate, or you have to simulate for a really long time. And this periodic steady state type simulations may not converge. That you may have difficulties there, ok. <coughs> hmm. So, then what about the noise from the charge pump current sources? Again, that uh, the current, no current noise is added only when the charge pump switch is on, ok. That uh, duty cycle modulation you have to take into account, ok. Because in this case, especially remember in the case of the CDR, in case of the linear uh, uh, phase detector, the upper switch was on for half a period, the lower switch was for on for a half a period. We even assumed that the two noises were the same, so then we added like the same noise to this one. But here, that is not the case. Uh, in steady state, both will be on, but for a small fraction of a period. So, you have to multiply the spectral density by the duty cycle to get the correct noise. But I will uh, do that later, but <coughs> what I can do is. I can either add <coughs> INCP here, this I will say is modulated by switch pulses, ok. And where should I add the resistance noise? In this case, if we have only R and C in series, we should add it uh, here. If we change the loop filter structure, basically it gets uh, added in series with the resistor. That is the best way to do it, ok. And this is the V control. And from this, you can calculate the transfer function from everything to everything.
Yeah, it is adding to the output of the charge pumper. So, hmm. yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what this INCP is basically from the two current sources, and it is modulated by the switch waveforms because it is passed to the output only when the switch is on. Okay, the current source will have noise. But the noise does not actually give the enter the enter the loop filter unless the switch is on. So, you have to take that modulation also into account. You understand? This is the noise, but this noise has no effect if the switch is off. Okay. So, it is only when the switch is on that it actually gets there. So, what I have shown as INCP is actually including all those effects. We will see later if we have to calculate it how to do that. So, now we can uh, calculate the transfer functions. So, let us first I mean the important ones are let us calculate phi out by phi ref and phi out by phi VCO. Maybe you can first calculate the loop gain L of s and then go from there. And if you have the old uh, CDR transfer functions in notebook, you should be able to write these right away. Okay. So this will be ICPR KVCO by n times s. Right. So, this uh, common factor times 1 that is the proportional path, common factor times 1 over S A R that is the integral path. And because we already have discussed uh, these things, we know that the 0 1 by R C has to come before the unity loop gain frequency, which is I C P R K V C O by n okay so this is the proportional path and that is the integral path and the actual loop gain will be So, of course, this I C P R K V C O by n is in radians per second, where K V C O itself is in hertz per volt. Okay. So, we will continue from here, you can calculate the other transfer functions also and for each of those transfer functions, you calculate the D C gain and you can draw the body plot and see and see what is the meaning of D C gain here. What is the D C gain of uh, phi out by phi ref? N. Why is that? What is the meaning of that? Anyway, think about it, we can discuss it. 